Welcome once again to this YouTube channel. I want to appreciate all those who have been watching and uh, subscribing to our videos and also sending to your friends. We encourage you to continue to share with all of your friends so that they can also benefit from content like this. In this particular video, we would be giving answers to the major series of the alternative to practical in chemistry. All right, so let's dive in straight into the answers. All right, so we have the first question here. Okay, student carries out the titration to find the concentration of a sample of uh, dilute, to find the concentration of a sample of dilute hydrochloric acid. All right, so we have a setup, and then we have the question here, which says, name the items of apparatus labeled A and B. All right, of course, you know that in titration, this apparatus labeled A is uh, the conical flux, and then that of B is the volumetric uh, pipettes. All right, so we use the volumetric pipettes to add um, exact volumes of uh, the alkali or the base. All right, so that means that you need to be really uh, familiar with uh, laboratory apparatus, their diagrams and their uses. All right, so that's for that's quite easy. Now, the next question says, the student has the indicator after the volume of 25 uh, centimeter cube of the alkali was has been measured. So explain why the student adds an indicator to the aqueous potassium hydroxide. So the essence of adding an indicator is so that the student can observe the change in color at the end point. All right, because after adding the indicator, the next thing is to begin to add the acid in drops until you observe a color change. So you use the indicator to help or to aid the process of observing the color change for you to know the exact volume of the acid that was needed to neutralize the alkali. So that's the concept of titration, all right? And whenever such happens, you know, you form the salt already, all right? So that is the essence of that indicator. So you need an indicator for a titration reaction. And then the next one says, name a suitable indicator. Of course, you know, we have methyl orange, we have thymophthalene. So any of that would get you the mark in this question. All right. So the next one says, describe how the student can determine the volume of dilute hydrochloric acid used in this titration. So from your knowledge of titration, the first step is to measure the initial burette reading. That is, you measure the initial volume of the burette of the acid in the burette. So when you get the initial volume, you begin the titration. And the moment there is a color change, you stop the addition of the acid and take the final volume of the burette. Then you take the difference. So difference means you go, you're going to do the final reading minus the initial reading. And that is how you determine the volume of dilute hydrochloric acid used in that particular titration. So basically, you have to include all of this information to get the two marks allocated for this particular question. So just like we have it there, first measure the initial burette, initial volume of the acid in the burette, measure start the titration, then measure the final volume of the acid in the burette, take the difference, that is the final reading minus the initial reading, and that should tell you the exact volume of acid that you've used for that particular titration. All right, and then the next question says, the student observes the color changes that occur as they add dilute hydrochloric acid from the burette. So state one other thing the student should do as they add the dilute hydrochloric acid to the aqueous potassium hydroxide. So what the student needs to do is to swell the flux, swell the conical flux, All right? Okay, you have the conical flux right here. So swelling is different from shaking, All right? Not shaking is wrong. So you swell. Swell is you, you move the, the, um, the conical flux in a, rot a rotational motion at a slow pace, okay? So that you are able to observe the, the, the color change easily, all right? So swell the flax or swell the conical flax will get you the full mark for that question. I think that's all for question one. So you can see the seven marks there are just quite easy to, to get. Okay, so we go to the next question, which is question two. For question two, first you need to understand the experiment. So you take your time to read through the old information given about the experiment, and that would help you to give the appropriate answers. So in this experiment, we have it that a student wants to investigate the temperature change when magnesium metal reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid. So basically, it's more like you're adding 
a magnesium metal into an acid and of course you know that's more of a displacement reaction okay it's a displacement reaction so a gas of course will be produced and that's hydrogen gas all right so the student does five experiments for this all right so we have all the information there you could see that the first step is you, the student used the 25 centimeter cube measuring cylinder all right they use the thermometer to measure the initial temperature of the acid then the, the magnesium metal is added to the boiling tube and the timer is used then it's continually stirred all right and then after 45 seconds they measure the temperature of the mixture in the boiling tube so as the displacement reaction is occurring it's more of an exothermic reaction so it is released and therefore there is a temperature change all right so let's dive in straight into uh, the same thing was done for experiment two all right and then you see um what is happening in experiment two in experiment two water then is added okay so water is added this two water was added in the second experiment all right to the whole um acid it was added and then in experiment three um four centimeter cube of this two water was added in experiment four six centimeter cube of this two water was added and in experiment five ten centimeter cube of distilled water was added. So what, what is happening here is we are varying the uh, volume of distilled water used. All right, so you see that uh, the volume of distilled water used in experiment two was just two. So the next one is four, six, and 10. But in the first experiment, um, distilled water wasn't used. All right, so, so that's just uh, the summary of the experiment. All right, so let's go to the questions attached to this. So the first one is to complete the table. All right, so you have a table first you have, to, you have to complete the volume of dilute sulfuric acid used so the volume of di dilute sulfuric acid used was constant all through the experiment okay if you read it from experiment one you see that you use a measuring cylinder a 25 centimeter cube measuring cylinder to pour 20 centimeter cube of the dilute sulfuric acid so in experiment one we use 20 centimeter cube of dilute sulfuric acid in experiment two, we still use the same volume, which is 20. And that continues because it's repeated for experiment three, four, five. All right, so that is why we have 20 all through for the volume of dilute hydrochloric um, um, sulfuric acid used. Now, the next column is to fill the volume of distilled water used, okay? So just like we had it in experiment one, distilled water wasn't used, wasn't added in experiment one. So that is why we have zero for experiment one year, all right? We have zero year, and then for experiment two, we had two centimeter cube of distilled water, and then four for experiment three, six for experiment four, and ten for experiment five. So we're just simply completing the table, all right? So the initial temperature has been given already, all right? So we don't have to do anything there. So what we need to fill again is the um, temperature after 45 seconds. All right, so all we needed to do was to read the thermometer to fill this up. All right, so we look at the first one, all right? So if this is 35, so you could read that, you see it's 37.0. And it is important that I we put the values in a decimal place, all right? Because you see the calibration of the thermometer, um, it's uh, kind of, we have some values that are in one decimal place. So it's important that you have a uniform um representation of the the values there is a, there's a, a mark allocation for that all right so this is 37 this is 34 all right this is 31.5 this is 30 just on the line uh this is um in between uh 27 and 28 so that's why it's 27.5 so ensure that when you're doing this you use uh the same decimal place for everything all right now the temperature increase is simply taking the difference between this and uh, this so you'll be able to find out the temperature difference so just take the difference so 37 minus 25 that gives us 12 34 minus 25.5 that gives us 8.5 and we go on and on until we get until we're able to complete the table i can see it's also in one decimal place to ensure that the whole uh, representation of the values are uniformed all right so that is how to complete the table so let's go to the next part of the question so it says state which experiment at the smallest temperature change. So just looking at the table, so looking at the column where we have the temperature increase. So we are, we are looking at this column now. So we have the first reading to be 12, 8.5, 6, 4, and 1.5. So this is 
um, the experiment with the lowest uh, temperature change, and that's simply experiment five. And that is how we are able to feel this as the answer. Explain why the temperature change was smallest in the experiment you have given. Uh, the answer is quite easy. We are using a, a, we are using a larger volume of water in this case compared to others. So because you're using a larger volume of water, for 45 seconds, you will not really experience a great temperature change because of the volume of water that is being used. Remember, we, this experiment is done for, for about 45 seconds. All right, so use a larger volume of water or a larger volume is being heated, so the temperature change within that period, within that short time, will not be uh, much because there are so many particles that need to be heated. All right. This is what we do in the masterclass, really. We try as much as possible to ensure that we're able to properly, right, teach learners how they can properly understand, interpret the question as much as possible. We dive deeper than just a past paper to ensure that at the end of the day, they're able to fully understand any question that is being administered to them. Okay, so... The next part of the question was to uh, uh, fill in or complete or plot this graph like we have it here. Just kind of trying to reduce this a bit. All right, so it's on the y-axis, you have the temperature increase, all right, and then on the x-axis, you have the volume of distilled water. So basically, what we used was the table uh, we had here to do this. Okay, so look at the, the plot. All right, we have five points right here on this plot, right? Uh, I think I just reduce this a bit. Okay, so we have five uh, different uh, spots, uh, points on the plot, all right, to, make, to represent the five different experiments. Okay, so we could see that uh, you're also asked to draw the line of best fits, all right? So the line of best fits uh, has to cover the whole area, okay, and you can see that most of the data points are not uh, picked up, but they are very close to the line of best fits, which makes it quite um, a good uh, graph. Okay, because the, the points are very close to the line. They're not so far from the line. Except this last point, which is a bit far off. But others are well within the line of best fit. All right, so this is how to draw the graph, okay, to ensure that it covers the whole data point. No one is uh, ex extremely excluded. All right, and then we are asked to use the graph in figure 2.1 to deduce the temperature increase when experiment 2 is repeated. So we're just going to do that quickly on this graph, all right? So with 7.5 centimeter cube of distilled water, we're basically looking at, uh, um, let's see this, at 7.5. So each of the lines here is a 0.2. So 7.5 is uh, 6, 6.2, 6.4, 6.6, 6.87, 7.2, 7.4. So 7.5 is in between here. So all you need to do is to extrapolate it this way and trace it all the way to the line that you drew. So if you trace that, you see that it's taking you or leading you to, uh, so we just trace this all this all the way here. You see where it is leading us. It's leading us to two, all right? So just trace this, trace, trace. All right, so you can see that the value of the temperature increase is two degrees Celsius. So all I just need to do is 2.0 degrees Celsius, okay? And I have to show what I've done on the graph. So it's not just about picking out the value. You have to show it on the graph because that is what uh, the question wants you to do. It says show clearly on the graph. All right. So please note that. All right. So moving forward, uh, we have done this. We've done, we've plotted the graph and we'll be able to extrapolate uh, any data that is needed there. All right. So the next question says the average rate of temperature increase in each experiment is calculated. So we have the formula. Now, calculate the average rate of the temperature increase in experiment one. So this is the formula, all right? So we look at uh, the temperature increase in experiment one, then we divide by 45 seconds. So we could simply pick a calculator. What's the temperature increase in experiment one? So we go back all the way to the table. We see the, the, the um, temperature increase in experiment one is 12. So it's basically going to be 12 divided by, so we're going to have 12 divided by 45. All right, so if we compute 12 divided by 45, what I have here is 0 0.27, all right? And the unit is, remember the unit of temperature is degrees Celsius, and this is second. So it's basically degrees Celsius per second. All right, and that solves that question. Okay, that solves that question. 
Okay, so moving forward, it says explain why the results of the experiment are more accurate if the boiling tube is wrapped, if the boiling tube is wrapped in cotton cotton wool. Okay, so cotton wool, when you wrap the um, the boiling tube with cotton wool, cotton wool acts as an insulator, right? It's not a conductor, it's an insulator. And how does it act as an insulator? It prevents the heat loss. And because it, it has prevented heat loss, you are now able to measure the accurate temperature. And that is for two marks. So you have to mention that the cotton wool acts as an insulator, preventing heat loss, which enables you to measure the temperature more accurately. So that is why cotton wool is used because you are dealing with a, an experiment that is so based on the temperature. So you want to ensure that you have the exact value of a temperature increase. All right. Next one says, explain why a 25 centimeter cube of volumetric pipette cannot be used to accurately measure the volume of the stood water. So if you go back to the experiment, you observe that we, in the experiment, we were varying the volume of the stood water. So we, we didn't use the two water in the experiment one, but we use the still water in experiment two, about two centimeter cube of the still water in experiment two, four centimeter cube in experiment three, six centimeter cube in experiment four, and 10 centimeter cube in experiment five. So you are varying the volume of these two water used. And a pipette cannot measure variable volumes. A pipette can only measure one volume. It is calibrated to measure only uh, one volume. All right, so it's calibrated to measure only one volume. So that is the reason why a pipette cannot be used in to measure the volume of the street water. Okay, because a pipette can only measure one volume, whereas variable volumes of the street water were used in that experiment. Okay, so next one says state one way in which the apparatus can be changed to give more accurate results. All right, so we observe while we're measuring the, um, let's go back to the description of the experiment. Okay, so we observed that a measuring cylinder was used to measure the acid. All right, a better apparatus could give more accurate results would have been a burette. So instead of using the measuring cylinder, a burette should have been used to measure the, uh, the volume of acid. So because burettes give more accurate readings than a measuring cylinder. That's an, an advantage of a burette over a measuring cylinder. Okay, the next question, sketch on figure 2.1 the graph you would expect if all of the experiments were repeated using a 2 centimeter length of magnesium ribbon. So in this case, you are reducing the length of magnesium ribbon from 5 to 2. So how will the graph look like? So when you reduce the length of the, of the metal or the, the, the magnesium ribbon, you don't expect a great temperature change. Okay, so if 5 centimeter cube is giving us about 12 degrees Celsius temperature change. Then if you are reducing it to about two, you should have a temperature far lesser, temperature change far lesser than that. And that is why we have this plot here that represents uh, the fact that um, the, te the temperature change has reduced. So it's not that you have to put your value exactly at four, just make sure you pick a value on the y-axis that is less than, uh, considerably less than 12. Okay, so show that you have reduced the, the, the surface area of the um, magnesium ribbon. So that is why we are, I, I simply picked four. So some other student could pick six as their option. It's okay, it's fine, right? But make sure that you are, do, it's considerable. Look at the, 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 the drop in size from five to two. So ensure that you have the right, um, um, ensure that you, are, you give enough gap in between the two different um, experiments. Okay, and then we, 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 we pick it to a point on the x-axis and we label it the G as the question has said. So that is how to do that. Okay, so you are given the, you can do, you are given the discretion, do it at your discretion, but you also, also have to be careful of how you represent your ideas there. All right, so that's for question two. So we're done with that. So we go to question three where you have to test. All right, so this is also very easy because you are given the data you use you need to do this experiment already at the end of the paper. All right, so a student tests two substances, solution E and so solid F. All right, so let's look at the test on solution E. It's chrom chromium 3 bromide. All right, so chromium 3 bromide simply tells you that, uh, okay, it's more something like chromium 3 bromide. 
So you are likely going to be testing for chromium 3 plus and you're also going to be testing for the bromide ion. So the bromide ion. So when you have a question like this, you are likely going to be testing for this. So you should have that at the back of your mind. All right, so let's look at the first now. So the first portion of solution E containing this, right? All right, the student adds, so you underline what was added, then you consult your table. So the student adds aqueous sodium hydroxide dropwise and then in excess. So we go to the table of our test result and see which one involves adding aqueous sodium hydroxide in drops and in excess. So I'll simply uh, switch to where I have my table. All right, I'm going to come all the way down to where we have the uh, cations. All right, so where we have the cations, you can see the effect of, um, okay, I'm just going to use my pen here. Okay, so we have the effect of sodium hydroxide. This is the column for it. Now, when you add, you're testing for, um, this is where you're testing for a cation. So you're testing for chromium-3 in this case. So chromium-3 ion, it will give a green precipitate in drops. But when you add it in excess, it becomes soluble in excess. So that green precipitate becomes soluble in excess. So that is the same information you transfer to your question. All right. So and you see the observations when you add it in dropwise is that you have a green precipitate. And then when you add it in excess, just like the table has said, the green precipitate is soluble in excess. So it becomes soluble. Now, to the second portion, we underline what was done again. The student added one centimeter cube of nitric acid and a few drops of aqueous silver nitrate. So, if you look at the first test, we simply tested for chromium ion. So, the next one, the next test you are likely going to be doing is the bromide ion. So, let's see if this is the test for the bromide ion. All right, so we go back to the table again. So, we go to the table of uh, anions. So, let's look at the test for bromide ion. Look at it here. So dilute nitric acid, aqueous silver nitrate. So it's correct. It's it's similar. It's exactly the same thing as the instruction that was given in the question. And look at the result. A cream precipitate was formed. All right. So we go back here and simply fix in the answer to be a cream precipitate. Okay. That would be the observation. All right. So that means you need to be very careful. Read the um, information. Read the instruction that was done and compare it to the table. If there's anything missing there, that means that that's not the correct uh, test for it. Okay, so that is just how to go about this. Okay, so we're done with test on, solid e, on solution E. So let's go to test on solid F. All right, so we have a lot of information here. So let's try and see if we could break them down quickly. All right, so we have that um, solution F. Half of solution F is in a boiling tube until there's no further change. So look at the observation. The white solid forms a colorless liquid steam comes up so that should tell you that the substance is hydrated okay and condensation is seen at the top of the boiling tube and then the colorless liquid becomes a white solid all right so these are just information so we are going to look at the questions and see which one we are expected to solve here all right so it says the observations in test one show that solid depth is hydrated okay hydrated means there is water all right it is chemically bonded to a water molecule so describe a chemical test to show that the condensation at the top of the boiling tube contains water so basically this question is simply asking you what is the chemical test for water all right so and there are two major ones you know you can remember the first one is when you use an hydrous copper two sulfate an hydrous copper two sulfate is white in color and the moment it comes in contact with water it changes from white to blue so you can either use this one or there is the other one where you use cobalt two chloride so cobalt two chloride an hydrous cobalt two chloride is blue in color but when it comes in contact with water, it becomes pink. So either you use an hydrous copper 2 sulfate or use an hydrous cobalt 2 chloride and state the correct um, color changes that are observed. All right, so from the test and observation in 3.1, it is not possible to identify the cation in solid air. All right, so give another test that can be carried out to help identify the cation. Now, the cations are ions with positive charge. So let's go to the table. Let's assume you do not know what to do here. So just go back to the table. This is test for anions, like you have it here. All right, so this is another test. This is a test for cations. And these were the instructions that were done in the experiment. But let's see if there's any other test for cations. These are for gases. So you can see another test for cations. These are cations. You can see they are all positive. All right, so the another test for the cation is a flame test. All right, so we just come back all the way here and you know have our answer as a flame test so the flame test is the under test that can be done uh, when you have cations you're trying to identify a cation 
All right, the next one says identify the anion in solid F. So let's see what steps were done. All right, so we see in test three that to the second portion of solution F, add dilute nitric acid. So look at what was added, dilute nitric acid and a few drops of aqueous barium nitrate. So let's go to test for anions and see what instructions are there. So under the test for anions, which one involves addition of dilute nitric acid and aqueous barium nitrate? So look at this. Now, dilute nitric acid, aqueous barium nitrate. All right, and you have a white precipitate as the result. And what are you testing for? A sulfate. All right, so you're testing for a sulfate. So, and that takes us back to the question. All right, so, and that seems we're testing for the sulfate ion. Okay, so the sulfate ion, which is SO4, uh, 2 minus. All right, so that's the anion you're testing for. This is what we do in the master class, really. We try as much as possible to ensure that we're able to properly, right, teach learners how they can properly understand, interpret the question as much as possible. We dive deeper than just a past paper to ensure that at the end of the day, you're able to fully understand any question that is being administered to them. Okay, I think that's all. And then we have the last question where you asked to plan an experiment. Okay, so a mixture, note this, it's a mixture. Okay, so, and when you have a mixture, what should come to your mind is it can be separated using any of the separation techniques that is applicable. All right, so for the fact that it's a mixture, it can be separated. Okay, so you could separate each of the components of the mixture. So let's look at the components of the mixture. We have ethanol, liquid ethanol. You could note the state of each of the compounds that make up the mixture, solid sodium chloride, solid zinc carbonate. Okay, so then you have a table here. So name of the compound is an all. It is soluble in water. Okay, of course, it's, it, it, there's, there's going to be nothing here because you are still adding the same solvent. And then sodium chloride is also equally soluble in water, but it is insoluble in it and all. So zinc carbonate is insoluble in water, equally insoluble in ethanol. So what we observe here is that the two uh, solid substances are insoluble in ethanol, but we have ethanol here. So these two are insoluble in this. So what we can do to remove ethanol is very simple. All we need to do is to filter the initial mixture. Because we have observed here that sodium chloride is insoluble in ethanol, zinc carbonate is equally insoluble in ethanol. So that means we can easily remove the ethanol by filtration. So the first step is to obtain ethanol, just like I have the question has said. Describe how to obtain a pure sample of each of the three compounds from the mixture. You are provided with common laboratory apparatus. All right. So the first step is to, obt to obtain ethanol first is to filter the initial mixture. Of course, you know what to use in filtering. You need a filter funnel. All right. You need um, this, um, you need um, a filter paper. All right, so you can, you can also mention what you need in the process of filtration when you are mentioning the laboratory apparatus. Okay, so that's the first step, filter the initial mixture, okay, to obtain the, 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 the ethanol, which is the, the, the filtrate. So the ethanol is the filtrate that you have obtained now. So whenever you do filtration, please note this, that whenever filtration is done, there are two things you could likely obtain in the process of filtration. You can obtain the filtrate, and you can also obtain the residue. All right? But in the first step to obtain ethanol, you are obtaining ethanol as a filtrate. That means the residue will now become the solid sodium chloride and the solid zinc carbonate. All right, so that is the first step. So you have obtained your filtrate, and that means you have described how you will obtain ethanol. All right, so that is the summary of the first step. So first step is filter the initial mixture to obtain ethanol as a filtrate. All right, now the second step is where you move, you move the residue obtained in step one, all right? So you use the residue obtained in step one to obtain the second one. Now to obtain the second one, you use, go back to your table. You see that um, sodium chloride is soluble in water while zinc carbonate is insoluble in water. So that means you could use water to um, easily separate them. All right, because one of them is soluble in water, the other solid is insoluble in water. So the second step is from your residue obtained in step one, add some water to the residue gotten from the first filtration process, stir and filter the mixture. 
All right. So when you add some water to the residue gotten from the first filtration process, the sodium chloride dissolves in that water while the zinc carbonate remains insoluble. Then you filter it. The moment you filter the mixture of what you have just done, what you simply obtain as your new residue is zinc carbonate. So you obtain your zinc carbonate as the next residue. All right? While the sodium chloride becomes a solution because it has dissolved in water. Now, because the sodium chloride uh, has di um, dissolved, so what you can simply do is wash your residue. You have obtained the residue of zinc carbonate. So wash the residue you've obtained with distilled water to remove all the impurities and dry the solid zinc carbonate. So in step two, we have simply obtained zinc carbonate. In step one, we obtained it at all. In step two, we obtained the zinc carbonate. And these are the processes that were involved to obtain the zinc carbonate. Okay, now we have the um, filtrates from step two. Remember, there's a filtrate in step two. After you have um, filtered in step two, you would obtain the residue, and your residue is now the zinc carbonate. But there is a filtrate left, and that filtrate is your solid sodium chloride that has dissolved. So to obtain that solid sodium chloride that has dissolved, you heat that filtrate, that is because it's a solution now. You heat it, okay, and then when you heat it, okay, the water um, evaporates or vaporizes, and then you obtain your solid sodium chloride. So these are the steps that will get you the full marks for um, all of so the full six marks for all of the process. So we see that what we are simply doing here is uh, filtering and trying to look at the filtrate and knowing what the residue is. So this is how to put all of this to get the full six marks. I hope you enjoyed the video and please endeavor to share with your friends and uh, thank you for watching. This is what we do in the masterclass, really. We try as much as possible to ensure that we're able to properly right teach learners how they can properly understand interpret the question as much as possible we dive deeper than just a past paper to ensure that at the end of the day they are able to fully understand any question that is being administered to them